Revived Thoughts is a production of Revive Studios. This is Troy and Joel, and you're listening to Revive Thoughts. In sober truth, this book is not only the book of God, but also the book of the human race. So to reject it is at once to be separated from the Lord and from enlightened man. Every episode, we bring you a different voice from history and a sermon that they delivered. Today, we're going back to 1839, where a Robert Breckenridge gave a speech in New York on May 8th. Troy, school's wrapping up, yeah? You got, you, you, as, a, as a teacher, a professor of the arts, you, uh, <laughs> I'm sure, are, are enjoying sending the kids home to, to have a nice, peaceful summer. Is that right? Yeah, it's no, it's great. We are almost to the end. I let me tell you, the the last two months or so of the year where we are is always just activity after activity. You have so many after school things, so mm-hmm. it is nice to finally be kind of clear of that margin and be seeing um, some light at the end of the tunnel of all our busyness getting a little bit cleared up. But it is a little sad. We have to graduate some some good kids off that are going to go off to different schools around the world. I'm very excited for them, but. I'm going to miss them. There are some good ones. And uh, the really cool thing has been just seeing some of their faith journeys. I had one of them I had been kind of, you know, counseling and working with this student. Basically, it was like at the beginning of the year, I didn't believe in God. And here's where I'm at now. And just there, it, it, is, it is never tiring to see how the gospel works on people, like to just see the changes and know that, man, that person, I remember they were very far from God and where they're headed now, they're in a much better place. It's just, it is really, really a privilege to be able to be a part of that. Well, Joel, how about you? How are things going for you over in the States? It's it's getting hot, I imagine. I mean, for us, it's always hot, but I imagine it's mm-hmm. starting to get hot for you. Uh, not too bad. Not yet. Um, we've had... It's stormy. Is it, it, This is like... Uh, you know, like in the... Twister movie, it, I, you know, there's another one. They're making a new <laughs> Twister. But they're like, oh, this I is like I heard about a, new Twister. It looks pretty and silly. And of all the things to remake and not dig, do it again, I'm actually okay with Twister 2. Twister 1 I'm, was such an unserious movie. I'm actually uh-huh. like, can we add more Twisters? You know, I don't yeah. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, there's something about 90s action silliness that I feel like our current society could use more of. You know, like, like wow. bring back... Well put. Everything has gotten ridiculously dark and serious in a lot yeah. of media you go back you watch movies from the 90s they they i think they had something figured out there where it is yeah. it is just pure dumb silliness in a way that yeah. is is entertaining and enjoyable twister prime example uh twister. but um maybe the penultimate I, example of just a movie that didn't take itself too seriously but also right. was just completely a fun time to watch for me though When I think of Twister, I think of Universal Studios where there's like a Twister Mm -hmm. ride where you like stand there and it like blows wind on you gently and you're like, oh, this is so scary. It's kind of like a real tornado. And for me, that was that was always a blast. So I am all about it. Yeah, I I remember the Twister exhibit. I remember thinking it was pretty dumb, but uh, (laughs) who knows? Maybe they'll spice it up now Maybe they'll do something new to it. They they got to grow with the times. Uh, But no, a lot of storms rolling through. We've had like... Again, I don't know what the numbers are, but it feels like a record amount of of tornadoes in such. I feel like every few days for the past like four weeks, we've had some pretty deadly tornadoes that have rolled through the Midwest. So yeah. it's a uh, it's interesting to see. I, Thankfully, I, my city has has gone unscathed so far. For the most part, I did get some hail damage on a car, which is never fun. But uh, you know, yeah. that's part of living in the Midwest. Is just just all it cars is. having dents all the time. I, I will say, I as somebody who's from afar reading the news, so occasionally we'll get emails from people in the inbox, and they'll be like, I heard there was an earthquake in Indonesia. Is, are you okay? And it's like, yeah, that in, that island is as far away from me as you are probably from like Florida to Chicago. So yeah, we're completely fine, but thank you for checking in kind of thing. <laughs> but I feel that way a little bit now where I'm like, I've been seeing a lot of news articles, and I feel like I see a, this devastating twister was caught on camera, like news article every couple of days. And I even remember yeah. it was just a couple of days I was talking to Elise. I was like, this is, there's getting a lot of tornadoes over there. Is everybody okay? Like that does feel like it from afar. It felt like you had mm-hmm. higher, higher numbers of twisters this year. Yeah. All right, yeah, Joel, well, from a near, it feels like we have higher twisters. Yeah. Let's jump into this. So we've got some positive responses to go over to on Revive Thoughts. I, I worked really hard to create like a diverse palette. Um, mm. And I feel like I managed to do it. So we have 
This one comes in from Facebook where somebody tagged the studio. I was listening to my friend podcast, aka Revived the Studios, a couple of days ago. I was listening to the episode about the missing history of the French Revolution, and it was so interesting. Three days later, I still find myself thinking about it. If I can't, I can't help but wonder what would have happened if the Christians would have stood up against the atheists and tore down the high places being used for the public demon worship. Sarah, thank you for your comments. And I have to say, I also wonder what could have happened. It is such a, just a bizarre story. Like you said, missing history there. I really think that the French Revolution uh, was missing that stuff going on. And I, it is a great question. What would have happened had all the Christians kind of risen up together and said no, instead of just what probably many of them probably did, which was kind of go quiet or not say and do a whole lot. Another one we got, Joel, was on our YouTube where we had on our five years of revived thoughts. Someone said, hi, guys, congratulations. And it looks like a little celebratory emoticon. Thank you, Danielle. We, we are excited to be able to say the studio is now officially five years old. And it was fun to be able to talk about those things with Joel. Uh, Patreon, we've gotten two for that because if you are a listener and you know, I have, we have been talking for almost a year straight about our Chinese Taiping Rebellion deep dive that we were going to drop. And if you are a Patreon, you have officially listened to, or at least had the opportunity now to listen to part one of that deep dive. And I, I gotta say, I was a little nervous. I've been talking about it for a while. It is a really weird story. I was like, is it going to translate? Are people going to be able to follow along with that weird, weird story? And the answer is so far, all the responses have been absolutely, and it's crazy. So one person Reach out and said, Troy, I enjoyed your deep dive into the Taiping Rebellion. I learned so much. Thank you for sending us that uh, that one there. And they also clarified that they were really grateful that Joel and I were able to kind of keep the names separated a bit. So that was really good, too. And then Ellen over on our Patreon chat said, finish part one on Taiping Rebellion. Interesting and looking forward to hearing more. So we have... A Patreon chat. If you are on our Patreon, not only do you get to listen to the Chinese, uh, the sorry, the the deep dive into the Chinese Taiping Rebellion and hear about how Jesus's brother took over China, and you'd also get access to other deep dives, even the ones we've never released: Joan of Arc, First Crusade, and Salem Witch Trials. But you also now get access to a fun little chat room. It's not. It's not like going crazy in there, but we it is. A, I find it to be a very little pleasant little chat room where people drop little thoughts they have and things that are going on. So all of these things, plus more, plus all the other stuff that come along with the Patreon are access to you if you jump in on there. So what are you, what are you waiting for? Let's get on it. Let's get on it to Robert Breckenridge. Robert Breckenridge, do you know anything about Robert Breckenridge before this episode, Troy? Absolutely. Robert Breckenridge. I mean, we all in the household. No, I had never heard of Robert Breckenridge. In fact, the way I I will explain how I found Robert Breckenridge at the end of the episode. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was actually by accident. I was looking up something for someone else when I discovered this guy. Yeah, now, you know, he we has should do. a cool story, but it was not should, what not what I do. Go ahead. We should. We should. So he I'll, I'll, I'll lightly tease. He's the grandfather of a. Oh well-known speaker yeah. that we have covered multiple times on this show oh and why didn't i think we, of that so yeah but we, so you have to guess but and by the time we get to the end of the intro you'll see if you're right or not that's a good that is a good way so you let us it, know after you've listened did you figure did you get it get it right who is this problem? guy this mystery man and as soon as you hear it, you're gonna if you didn't if you don't already know who it is you're gonna go oh, of course of course that's who it would be but I, so it's funny when I found this guy, I found him because I was looking at the, the guy that the famous guy we know. And I was like, Oh, his grandpa was somebody. And I was reading a story. I was like, he's a pretty cool guy. He seems like a great guy. We should cover him. And then I, that, I sent the sermon out months ago, months and months go by. I come back, I do the research on this episode in the very end. I'm like, Oh, he's so-and-so's grandfather. And I was like, of course he is. I remember months ago, that was why I had chose him in the first place. And so I like got to be su- like re re surprised by that. So there you go. Um, okay. Let's jump into this. Joel, take us away. <laughs> okay, Robert Brackenridge, born in the year 1800. So for people doing the math about who his grandchild might be, uh, you can you can follow the, the line down. Born in the year 1800, boy, does he seem like he comes from the closest thing to royalty that we had in America at the time. Like he... Like just like the rich, you know, like when you think of like your the the drama and stuff happens with super rich families. That seems like that seems like what was up his alley because his whole family was super rich and they were had their fingers in a bunch of pots and were very. They, they had uh, political people, they had ministers in the family, people that held a lot of power in the family. 
So that Breckenridge family was probably, you know, it was one that people knew. He was born in Kentucky, but when he was just a boy at the age of six, his father would end up dying. And he ended up being raised largely by, you know, essentially like tutors, educational systems in place. And he was educated very well at a scholarly level. His tutor growing up was the brother of John Marshall, who was the chief justice of the Supreme Court at the time. One of his brothers graduated Princeton, and he had another brother that was going there. So in 1817, he enrolled to go to Princeton himself. However, he bleed the, the black sheep out. You know, this, uh, this is... This is the type of stuff movies are made out of, right? Because he got into a fight his senior year, got kicked out of Princeton, uh, and that made him quite bitter to Princeton itself. And while Princeton, you know, kind of uh, uh, set in line a path of redemption and forgiveness for him to continue to graduate, he was done with Princeton. And so uh, he left not finishing the school, even though he was so close. I think that's funny because that will not be his only run in with Princeton. Now, he then enrolled in Yale. And by the way, I do love these guys in 18 years. Like, ah, I'm done with Princeton. I'm going to Yale now. You know, that just something mm-hmm. that most of us cannot relate to. Uh, he only had three months of courses at Yale. And he should have been done. But apparently, Yale did not give you a graduation until you'd lived there for at least a year. Like, you could not walk. And so he was like, well, I'm not going to just sit around Yale for nine more months with nothing to do. No classes to take. I'm, I'm, he was that close to being done at Princeton. So then he changed his plans. Once again, it went to Union College and just finished it up there and said, I don't have to wait a year. I can just be done and be, I can be done with this all very quickly. So ran through as many colleges as he could there. Breckenridge really did not follow God during this time. And, and when I say not, I mean, not at all. He was not a Christian. I don't know, no um, hints or beliefs of it at all. He, he was out in the open about it. He had no direction. After he graduated, he was the guy who just basically kind of kept coasting. His family had money. He would go from one party of aristocrat, you know, like people in America to another. Um, at one point, he offended a guy, and a guy wanted to get in a duel with him. Breckenridge kept refusing, and everyone called him a coward. He kept, like, changing the dates of the duel. Finally, he did buy pistols to do the duel, but he was doing everything he could to stop the duel. And then this one I've never seen in our episodes before, but the Freemasons, the Masonic Lodge, basically found out about the duel and was like, hey, wait a second here. This this guy that you're going to get a duel with is, is one of our members, um, and we, we don't want this duel to happen. So we're basically telling you, both of you, don't get in the duel. And Breckenridge was like, I didn't want to get in the duel in the first place, so fine by me. But, I mean, what a weird, odd story. And that just tells you, I think I feel like that's a really good example. Like, this is the kind of life he was living. Like, he's he's all over the place. He's, he's a ruffian, and he's not even trying. He's just trying to have fun. Uh, One of his brothers was really trying to encourage him to kind of get back into serious stuff. You're a smart guy. He told him he should go into law school. He kind of was considering it. Um, And then around that same time, that that brother of his just died suddenly, unexpectedly. And Breckenridge ended up with a family fortune, but he kind of at this point now needed to do something. And so he decided he would run for office. And again, that even in itself to me is funny. I, oh, I've got money. I'm running the family. I guess I should just run for office. Um, and it worked. He got elected. He was a very, very good speaker. And he would go on to get reelected three times until he quit the, quit the office. He didn't, you know, he never got ousted. He never got beaten. He just, he didn't, he decided he was done at the age of 28. And this was because he had recovered from a very bad illness that almost took his life. He had recently lost one of his daughters, and he had earlier lost a second daughter. And he just felt like, what's the point of living life? Like, I'm getting crushed here. I almost died. I'm losing children. I'm not, yes, I'm elected to office. And yes, I have a lot of money. But none of this is fulfilling to me. What am I actually supposed to be doing here? And so he started talking to his brother, going, his brother was a Presbyterian minister, and his brother was basically like, come with me, come to church, you need, you need Jesus. And going to his brother's church, getting counsel from him, he converted, became a Christian, and, uh, and, and that's when everything starts to change. So these first 28 years of his were, were really quite rough, and a lot, I mean, he almost died in a duel for crying out loud, um, but it, it, once, he, once he becomes a Christian, there's a stark contrast on that before and that after. Yeah, so then he goes back to work as a congressman, but this time as a Christian congressman, which is a very different con- type of congressman. He fought against things like the enslaved Africans and also against uh, transporting mail on the Sabbath. He started to host uh, what he called In the Woods 
prayer revival meetings. He really wanted to be a, a person that was very involved in ministry. One minister said of him, Brethren, you'd better be careful how you receive Mr. Breckenridge. He'll either make or break the Presbyterian Church. Before his conversion, he was considered the best dancer, the best hunter, and the best stump speaker in Kentucky. That was well said. Joel, I could really tell your Kentucky accent was coming out on that. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't even try. That would be, uh, uh, we would get hate mail for sure. We uh, within would be a sure. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Within a couple of years, he had uh, gone back to Princeton to study theology, but he wouldn't actually end up finishing that uh, degree either because his brother's old church needed a pastor. And, you know, he thought, hey, why, why stick around here when I'm needed right now? So he went to go and pastor his brother's church. However, as a member of the church, he was a controversial figure. Surprise, surprise. So I will say, I do think Princeton ends up honor giving him like an honorary degree at one point, but I, I don't remember, so don't don't get me. I didn't. I could look that up, but we need to move on. But it is funny to me how many times he's like, "I'm going to Princeton." Ah, uh, just kidding. I'm back out like that it's two <laughs> times. It may not sound like a ton of times, but that's probably a lot more times than the rest of us have gone to Princeton and backed out. So it just makes me laugh. I, first, he wrote some pamphlets attacking the Catholic Church. Basically, he literally said, all superstitions in the country can be stemmed in some way back to the Catholic Church. Now, <laughs> I don't know that every single superstition can be, but I mean, it's true. They, they can uh, certainly go in that direction. But the Catholic Church was like, okay, you can't say all of them stem from us. Um, so they sued him for libel in 1840. The Catholic Church went to, I mean, which tells you what kind of impact he was making, at least on his town, that they took him to court and said, he blamed every single superstition on us. We, you can't do that. And he, he only got away with it because the jury was a hung jury where, you know, they can't, they couldn't completely decide whether or not he was actually suable for libel on this or not. So he, he got off on a technicality. Um, and that really didn't stop him. He would go on to continue writing more pamphlets and books. So he was very fiercely like, I'm getting Christianity out there and I'm going to tear down anybody who gets in my way. Internally though, inside the Presbyterian church, he was also, he was making waves. At the time, the Presbyterian church was sending missionaries to work for other organizations. And Breckenridge demanded that Presbyterian missionaries should be overseen by the Presbyterian church, which caused a stir. And I was thinking about that. I was like, at first I was like, well, that doesn't, Seemed like a very controversial position. Like, of course, the missionary, you know, the SBC looks after their people with the, um, their I, they, I think it's the IMB, right? And then the, uh, the, you know, a lot of times the denomination does look after their own missionaries. But then I was like, well, wait a second, though. If you're a Presbyterian and you want to join Hudson Taylor in the China Inland Mission, you know, Breckenridge would say, no, you have to be under a Presbyterian group. And so then I was like, okay, actually, that is a pretty controversial thing. I can see why that would cause a big, a big stir for people to decide. I can see why Breckenridge would say, hey, if we're elders over these people, we should be over them when they're working overseas. And I can also see why people who want to go work for Hudson Taylor and China Inland Mission, but they have maybe varying beliefs would want to say, don't, I could see how that could be very controversial. His wife of 12 years died around the same time, and he ended up becoming a college president shortly thereafter, but the students led an uprising against him at the school, and so he shortly left after that. I looked for information, like, why did they rise, rise up against him, and I couldn't find it, but, I mean, he's the first guy in all of our times of talking to presidents and talking to, you know, they took over these schools and stuff. He's the first guy I've ever seen where they rioted against him, so he must have... I, I, I hate to be harsh on the guy, but I'm thinking that he did something that might have made them angry. I'm not going to blame him. Maybe it was maybe he was making changes that needed to happen, but he is the first person on our school list that we've seen this happen in. Um, around this time, he fell in love with another woman, and she was a widow. They exchanged love letters and poems. Everyone, everyone advised against them going together, uh, but they got married anyway, and the children of their previous marriages from both sides were very causing a lot of tension. It almost led to them divorcing, but they eventually worked through it and ended up being happily married together in the end of it um, until she died. After becoming the chief superintendent, uh, and he is known as the father of modern public schools in Kentucky, um, during that time, Kentucky was very rural, and getting a school system put in place took a lot more work than it did in other places from what I was reading. And he helped do that in the late 1840s and 1850s. After that, he went on to found Danville Theological Seminary, which I, he, he has a very diverse life. He's been all over the map here. In 1860, he was 60 years old, and he went to preach to an audience. Remember, he had always been this great speaker, and people were really looking forward to it. Sadly, though, it seemed like his age had caught up with him. The only 
commentary you can find on this speech was one of the people basically said, yeah, Dr. Robert J. Breckenridge preached here last Sabbath. I suppose his reputation is too well known for me to say anything to you about him. Yet his feeble, feeble voice, his lack of teeth, and his lack of the graces of a great orator caused a lot of disappointment among the audience who came to hear him. So I was a little sad to hear that in his later years. He, he, he seems to be trying his best. He's doing lots of great work, but he seems to have lost some of that speaking, uh, that shine he once had, which is actually one of the first time I've ever seen somebody be like, yeah, he seemed great when he was younger. I mean, I feel like that's pretty realistic, though. Like, we don't like yeah. to think uh, people... Uh, Normally, it's all halos and angels, and they, they, they say, you know, even till his 95th birthday, he still, he whispering from the deathbed, he still had it. It was, Which it was is interesting to true. see some... I think it can be, but, it, you know, George Mueller and some of those guys we cover, I think it's true, but it was really interesting to see somebody be like, he, he was probably better back in the day, and I'm like, wow, when he had you don't teeth. normally get that one. <laughs> when he had to uh, um civil war starts american civil war that puts him in a weird spot because he lives in the south and he's from the south but he is very much uh, a man against those values of the south being a, a christian believer that is very much against slavery coming from a wealthy family and also from his second marriage he did inherit a bunch of slaves but he was a big proponent of abraham lincoln and he would give speeches for lincoln despite a lot of controversy within his family his own nephew was uh the vice he would have been the vice president to the the democratic party the opposing party but breckenridge himself he pushed very hard for the north to win the the union and put his seminary firmly behind the U the Union, writing regular updates and reports of the situation to them. It was a pretty messy family ordeal. You know, you hear about a brother fighting brother, you, you know, if they're else that's like that kind of standard cliche saying in the Civil War. But uh, for many families, including his, it was a, a, a literal reality. Two of his sons fought in the Union, and uh, two of his other sons fought in the Confederacy. At one point, his son-in-law was going to be executed, and he stepped in and used some of his uh, his political power to. It seems like you know pull him pull him off the executioner's block there. Yeah, so you can see. I mean, and imagine too. It's one thing to think, okay, both your sons fought on separate sides of this big war, but. I, once the war is over, I don't imagine those scars immediately heal. So this is going to be something that your family has to deal with for a very long time. At 71, he dies. He had a rough life of illnesses, multiple losses of family, uh, literally lived through and had to deal with all the stuff of the Civil War. And he had taken a lot of heat for his pretty much his entire career once he became a Christian for his very vocal opposition to slavery in Kentucky. Also, I thought it was, I, I wrote it in there. I just thought it was funny that he, he was, when he became a Christian, like two of his big points was slavery needs to go and also no delivering the mail on the Sabbath. Like it just, it's funny to me that like those things in his mind were of equal sins against God. Um, but anyway, he, he said, but his whole life, he's his vocal opponent against slavery. At its, I mean, during the Civil War in Kentucky, that was not be a necessarily easy thing to do. Yet he never compromised his walk with God after becoming a follower of Christ, it really seems like even though his life wasn't easy, he, he had a riot at his school, he lost a wife, he had a lot of stuff going on. Uh, people, he seemed to really be following the Lord all the way through. And certainly a completely different life than his pre-saved 28 years where he was just partying and starting duels. His family also is important, though, and the reason we told you at the top, this guy is, it is the grandfather of an important person. Well, his daughter, Mary, will end up marrying a man named William Warfield, and they will go on to have a son, Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield, which we know today as B.B. B. Warfield, which we've had on our show a couple different times and is a pretty famous figure that has loomed over a lot of our episodes in a good way. Like, we, we really respect a lot of what he did, and the reason... I found him in the first place. I was looking up something on Warfield, saw that he was named after his grandfather, Breckenridge, and I thought, well, who's this Breckenridge guy? When I read his story, I was like, he seems like a pretty wonderful guy. Now, this sermon you're going to be listening to is called Plea for Restoration. And I, if you remember, he was in charge of the public school system to a degree in Kentucky. And during this, this sermon, he's giving these speeches to these different societies 
that are they're, they're, they societies reformed to get the Bible back in the public schools. You maybe hear people talk about that today. Well, 200 years ago, they were doing the exact same thing. And this is one of those speeches where he's pleading for the word of God to be put back into the schools. Apparently they were not. And he's saying, we've got to get them back in the schools. We've got to get the Bible back in the hands of young students. And I read this sermon and I thought, A, this is super applicable to stuff that's going on today. But two, uh, to the B, the second point here is it's also just a really good defense for the word of God. And it's really interesting because many, many of the same arguments for the word of God being the center of our lives today were the exact same arguments, it seems, that they were having 200 years ago. So I hope you enjoyed this sermon by him called The Plea for Restoration. The use of scripture as a reading book in common schools is of such importance as to deserve immediate and universal encouragement in all our states and territories. In the very fact of our organization as a society for the printing and distributing of the scriptures, we have assumed as undeniable the great truths that the Bible is a divine revelation from God, that it is given for the whole human race, that it is most fit to be received by all and that it is perfectly adapted to produce its intended effects. Even more, that it is our duty to make efforts for the multiplication and dissemination and the general reception of these scriptures among men. And still more clearly, the one I stand here to advocate has this great advantage, that while it fully accords with the whole objects and principles of the society, it opens a vast and nearly unexplored field for its exertions. It is the beginning, as I trust, of a national effort to restore in youth the divide between piety and knowledge, between God and the first search of childhood after mental treasures. Perhaps the most striking aspect of my duty is that its performance should have ever been needed, but especially in this country and at this present time. From the beginning of time till a period very near to us, and among the entire race of man, except for reformed Christians of these recent days, but the general principle that is the base of this subject has been universally received and acted on as of paramount importance. Every people, without exception, has thought it necessary to teach its religion to its children as the very basis of all other knowledge. And every nation that has been sufficiently advanced to have a written religion and places for the regular instruction of youth in knowledge has made the national religion a national study in childhood. The sacred books of all heathen nations have been known to all who knew anything at all. The pages of the Koran in every age and country have been the first study of every follower of the false prophet. The very highest literature of all antiquity is thoroughly enmeshed in the popular religion, so that every Greek and Roman youth was made a scholar and a pagan by the same education process. The Hebrew parent, by the most express command of God, made his child from its very birth by very outward mark and every inward accomplishment, at home, by the wayside, in the school, in the sanctuary, in the halls of justice, on the field of battle, and upon the throne itself, thoroughly and intensely a Hebrew. The early Christian church was in no degree less diligent in the same devotedness to the exact and universal religious instruction of the young. Every corrupt and apostate sect which has forsaken or renounced our divine Redeemer, and most conspicuously those that have thoroughly and openly rejected the Bible, has been sure to teach its own particular heresies by every means, not excluding their schools, into the minds of their children. The leaders of the glorious Reformation of the 16th century, and for two centuries and more, all their true followers, received as from God the solemn duty of the public as well as private instruction of the young in the word of life. The illustrious spirit of Luther, as he drew near his rest, in a review of his literary labors, rejoiced the most in this, that he had written his book De Servo Arbitrio against Erasmus, and had prepared his small catechism for children, a performance which, like the similar one of his immortal fellow laborer, John Calvin, remains each after the lapse of 300 years, respectively, the symbol of churches, state, and races. No, until a period so little remote that many who hear me can recall it, the schoolhouse and the church stood side by side throughout our country, and the Bible and the catechism constituted in both the basis of perpetual instruction. 
It is not my present duty to trace the cause and the manner of the exclusion of the Bible from our schools. It is sufficient to indicate as the chiefest the spirit of popery, which everywhere suppresses the word of God, the spirit of indifference, which treats it with total apathy, and the spirit of infidelity, which openly rejects it. Other causes less obvious have no doubt conspired in the production of the same fatal result, among which are the excessive multiplication of school books of inferior quality, a proportionate increase of incompetent and unworthy teachers, and that part of the education of youth which could be turned to immediate profit. Nor can it be denied that the system of Sunday school instruction, so valuable in itself, has been at least an occasion for this great evil. That the public has been allowed, it may be even induced, to consider the moral instruction done there a sufficient substitute for that formally given in the weekday schools, if not even a substitute for that before being received under the parents' roof. A general review of the efforts which have been made in our day to restore the Bible to the schools would occupy far too much time to now be attempted. Although this, like the mode of its exclusion, is a portion of this great subject full of interest and importance. It may be sufficient to state in passing that the minds of Christians over the whole world have been for some years deeply pondering this matter. The Protestant churches generally throughout Europe have made a more steadfast resistance than ourselves to the exclusion of the Bible from the course of general education, and are therefore in this respect generally in a better condition than ourselves. In England, there's no school system of sufficient extent to deserve the name of national, but the institution which has the oversight of what are called the national schools has introduced the scriptures into them. The schools of Scotland, as far as they have been under the care of the national church of that kingdom, remain on their ancient model. But in regard to our own country, the only successful effort of a general kind with which I am acquainted has been lately made in the state of Maryland, where the admirable society which I represent this day are now in the midst of an attempt which has been attended with the most cheering success. In the course of that movement, two facts of great importance in themselves and strongly illustrative of the past and present spirit of the country have been fully established. The first is that the public mind is more thoroughly prepared for this great reform and all the sources of public influence and authority are much more accessible in regards to it than the most optimistic had supposed. That is, God has prepared the work to our hands before we had faith and zeal to undertake it. The second fact is that the more prestigious the schools are, the more completely is God excluded from them, and the strongest in opposition to the introduction of the Bible. While many of the humblest sort have all along kept the scriptures in them, but it is the richest sort of our people, who in many other respects have been among the most of all indifferent to God and removed from an evangelical influence. It is an item in this hasty outline, too significant and too pleasing to be left out, that all our Christian missionaries, as it is believed without exception, have made the Bible the principal class book in every school established by them. It may be observed, then, as the first accepted truth of every individual consideration on this subject, that religion is the most imperative necessity of the human soul. No people has ever been without the elements of a regular system of religious faith, so that man is as essentially religious as he is a rational, a speaking, or even a defined being at all. It is equally undoubted that this necessity of the soul is developed as early as any other need of it, and that it has evolved with a steadiness and intensity equal to any other. So what conceivable excuse can be made for not providing for this necessity from the first moment of its development? Since it is necessary, why would you not instruct and direct it? For not sustaining and molding this confiding and absorbing impulse by the power and the wisdom which God has made manifest to this very end? I let it be further considered that there are but two possible foundations upon one or the other of which all religion must repose. One is authority and the other conviction. The former, professing to emanate from the throne of God and to be perpetuated in a manner always supernatural, sustains its pretensions by unceasing miracles and appears before men only to state its claims and receive unqualified obedience to its commands. To hear, to believe, and to obey are in its view the sole duties of mankind, while to reason, to investigate, to compare, to inquire, to analyze, are all alike rebellious against its sacred character. On the other hand, the religion of conviction, recognizing God as its author, 
and the present blessedness and eternal glory of man as its immediate ends, throws open the heart, the mind, and the conscience to its sweet and ennobling influences. It appeals constantly to understanding. It pleads for nothing more earnestly than for the most ample, thorough, and mature considerations. It asks for dominion over the affections, the conscience, the intellect, only when that dominion will have been conceded by a willing, an enlightened, a convinced spirit. This is our religion. This Bible is at once its sacred repository and the great instrument of its spreading. Why then will we withdraw it from the very seats of knowledge? Why withhold it from the active and inquiring spirit of childhood? Our religion is based on knowledge, founded in liberty, approved by conscience. Let us act as if we felt this to be true. In the general education of youth, we commit a great mistake as to what education really is, and in deciding who is educated, they fall into a fatal error. To omit in education all moral training is to train imperfectly for time and not at all for eternity. It is indeed to neglect the man himself and to drain some of his inferior powers. No man is or can be educated whose moral faculties have not been adequately trained, and if they have been mistaught, he has been enslaved, not educated, degraded, not enlightened. Now it so happens that among us, the case is so presented by reason of a thousand different circumstances that no adequate moral instruction can be furnished generally in our public schools unless the Bible itself be put into the hands of the pupils, so that we are shut up to the necessity of rejecting from public education all true discipline and instruction of the better and more urgent part of our being or of using for those purposes the best and greatest and fittest of means, the teacher of teachers, the very word of God himself, which forces a people panting to be taught to remain in ignorance or learn of God. For if we restrict our views of education so narrowly as to embrace in its scope only that which is purely mental, no absurdity can be more audacious than to reject the Bible even from such a plan. Is it of use to know what we are, what we can be, and where we have been? to know how we can be and achieve whatever is the most excellent? Is it a part of instruction to set before us the highest exhibition of whatever is great and striking in the past? The greatest virtue, the greatest passion of achievement, of effort, of transcendent civilization, and of unparalleled crime? Well, what is the Bible? It is, among other things, the record, the safest, often the only record of the largest, the longest, the most striking part of the history of genius, of knowledge, of sublime adventure, of all glorious success, yes, of man himself. It is the textbook out of which to unriddle the great mystery of God's providence and the government of the world. The greatest of all poets, philosophers, orators, moralists, lawgivers, rulers, and conquerors, who have adorned those long annals which cover two-thirds of the whole duration of human existence here on earth. These are the men who have written this book. It contains their legacy of wisdom and instruction to generation of generations, a legacy so vast and so enduring that one single man, and he the beginner of this book, has bestowed in a few brief pages the elements of civilization, of organized society, of law, of morals, and of religion upon every age that has succeeded him, and stamped the impression of his mind upon the whole human race. Why, this book, which is the sum and substance of all literature more ancient than the Greek, is the dirt also of whatever exists in our modern tongues. The two great Protestant translations of the Bible, the Germanic and our own, formed, in truth, the two languages, and they reign over them still when centuries have passed. They are the highest classic, respectively, in each language. In sober truth, this book is not only the book of God, but also the book of the human race. So to reject it is at once to be separated from the Lord and from enlightened man. Let us turn for a moment to the social aspect of this question. Our great republic and all our free and sovereign commonwealths have been frankly periled upon this great stirring truth, that man is capable of self-government. Not men everywhere, for history would contradict us, not man brutal and demoralized, for our previous reasonings show this to be absurd, but generally the truth that man, enlightened, civilized, and free, is the safest depository of all ultimate authority. If this is not true, our country is undone. If it is true, the people must nevertheless be sustained in that condition, 
which we call enlightened, civilized, and free. But I believe no reflecting man will hesitate to admit that of all influences which affect the character, the prosperity, the duration, the glory, and the usefulness of nations, moral influences are incomparably the most controlling. And of that immense class of influences, which might in a large sense be called moral, the most important and enduring are beyond all doubt those which are strictly religious. Is it too much to assert that the influence of a national religion is greater upon national character than all other influences combined? Is it going too far to declare that the destinies of states have been more deeply affected by their religious faith than by all other circumstances? The very history of mankind is essentially and chiefly a history of religious ideas and religious developments. The great intellects of all ages have comprehended this truth, and though they differed about what religion is or should be, yet they felt and saw that to the world it is in fact everything. In every nation before these latter days of scoffing, the entire mass of men felt the same truth. And so the passionate opposition of them all to every change in their national faith. The sentiment uttered on this platform today by the chief magistrate of this commonwealth, that without the Bible, this republic would never have existed, is as just as it is emphatic. And I solemnly insist upon this inference from that truth, that without the Bible, this republic cannot continue. For the general principle contended for has a most peculiar application to ourselves. Our institutions belong to an advanced condition of society. They can be sustained only by a community whose moral condition is as special and as advanced as their social system. The Bible contains the religion of this nation. This Bible, which alone is able to prepare our children for virtuous and enlightened liberty, which contains the sanction of our Creator to the principles of our polity and throws the sacredness of religion around the simple, upright, humane, and free spirit of our institutions. This Bible, which is of value to us, equal to the value of liberty and independence, because it contains our religion, and which has besides this inappreciable worth, that its religion is true and divine, and the only religion that is, either one or the other. This Bible, which will perpetuate our glory, if that it can be done at all, and if it cannot, will prepare our posterity to be and to do in the midst of all calamities whatever becomes the worthy descendants of our glorious ancestors. This treasure of all treasures we dishonor and defile by a deliberate act of national rejection. No truth is more clearly established by the whole course of history than that there is a wise and holy providence continually exerted over the nations of the earth. They rise and flourish and pass away under the eye and by the purpose of him who in the development of his sublime proposals will not allow them to abide in strength which would be used to his dishonor and who in piety to suffering man will not permit the principles of evil to consolidate their force and accumulate, through successive ages, irresistible means to do wrong. Without the blessing and favor of God, no nation can stand, no people endure. Oh, how multiplied and how sad are the evidences of this truth, and how continually he has taught us that his blessing is to be expected only by the grateful and the obedient, that his favor is bestowed only as we walk in the ways directed by him and toward the ends which he proposes in all his pervading goodness. But the revelation of his will is contained plainly and alone in this blessed volume, which we dishonor by a great public act. And the promises of his favor and protection are written in those pages which he has so urged, persuaded, commanded us to make the light of life in every condition, every age, every relation, and every office through which his providence may guide us. O oh, blessed are those people whose God is the Lord. Is it not to be assumed that such an event as the exclusion of the word of God from popular education could occur or continue for a considerable time without resulting in situations by which even good men might be deceived? Several objections to the restoration of the scriptures to the schools are so often urged by persons deserving to be heard that it seems necessary briefly to state and answer them. Among these, the most frequent, perhaps, are urged against the scriptures themselves, which, it is alleged, are in many cases far above the comprehension of children and youth. 
and which are, moreover, so often disfigured by a certain plainness of expression as to be unsuitable for promiscuous or even public reading before the young. To this, the first reply may well be that God who created us and who perfectly knows us has judged otherwise, and that he made the volume of his word such as we have it, and has added the most express and emphatic commands that it be early, constantly, publicly, constantly read. To all this he has joined the most precise assurances that exact obedience to this precept will have no other tendency than to make us wise and pure here below, and blessed beyond conception forever, that all manner of intercourse with him and all communion with his holy word are most pure and profitable, and that all contrary attempts are highly offensive to him and full of dishonor to his infinite being. As a second reply, it may be stated of equal truth that all experience proves the objection to be entirely mistaken, for of all mankind, the wisest, the purest, the best, are selected to write this sacred volume. And in all ages, the objectors themselves will even say, if this has not been eminently the character of those who have been the earliest, the most thoroughly, and the most sincerely pondered, mastered, imbibed, and rejoiced in its precious contents, but as a final answer, it is to be considered that if the objection has any weight, it will lie not only against the early and promiscuous study of the Bible, but also in a fundamental manner, first against the Christian religion itself, and secondly against all religion completely, as being in itself too obscure for profitable study and too immodest for public statement. For there are multitudes of truth which adult ears do not unravel better than the simplicity of childhood. Yes, of truths which are the most vital in Christianity, and as religion, in a large sense, if it is true and profitable to all, must teach us what God is and what he requires of us. A second objection, which seems to be urged out of a spirit of special concern for the Bible itself, they would exclude it from the course of systematic education, or else create too much familiarity with it in its early life, which could harm religion itself in later years. This conceit is founded in total ignorance of the human heart, and they who utter it overlook one of the firmest and most unalterable laws of our moral being. The objects which we cherish most fondly and most steadfastly are those which first occupy our early and passionate thoughts. The soul cherishes a kind of immortal gratitude for which made it first acquainted with itself and revealed to it all its strengths. Our earliest associations are our most enduring ones. Our first friendships are not only our sweetest, but as one by one they fail and pass away, we learn with surprised grief that they are friendships which cannot be replaced. We make new friends, valued, dear, perhaps even more deserving. But oh, they are those we trusted first in childhood, not those whose images grew into the substance of our hearts. The deepest feelings of the human breast have been linked by God in adamantine chains with the strong impressions and vivid remembrances of our early years. The objects of that period are the sacred objects of life, and the heart will not endure to have the least of them invested with less than the costliest of its treasures. Oh, that we could bind the early and tender affections of the whole people to the name of Christ, to the throne of God. Oh, that this fatal familiarity with divine truth was the universal heritage of the children of our country. There are those who make it a third objective to restoring the Bible to the schools that we have reason to dread great strifes and permanent division among the friends of education, if not of religion itself, by pursuing this enterprise. It is to be feared that many who call themselves the friends of education are totally opposed to all religious influence, either in the school or the community, and there are many reasons to suppose that there are plans whose success would exclude forever all moral instruction from the course of popular education. This branch of this great subject needs and must receive first or last a thorough sifting, but this is not the occasion. I will at present merely say there can be no union of effort between those friends of education who exclude from their system all moral training and those who make conscience of taking the Bible to school with them. And the sooner the question is made between them at the bar of the public, the better for the country. But the question involved is no less than this, whether the education of a religious people will be subjected to an infidel or a Christian control. As it relates to the true friends of the Bible, there can be no cause or even occasion of strife here. 
If there is one single point in which all true Christians can unite, it is surely this, that the word of God should be given to the human race and be received by it. Or, if this may not be, it is the strongest possible proof that there must be some inherent or some providential hindrance to all united action against those who are earnestly contending for the same general object. This I do not believe. We will find the Christians of this country united, not divided by the present proposition. While it may separate the friends of the Bible more widely from its enemies, it will bind them more firmly to each other. For the rest, strifes and divisions are the price we pay, for all that is precious in a sinful world. It can be nowhere better met than under the shadow of the cross. No standard is more worthy to endure them under than the banner of divine truth. No object can be set before us for which we might better suffer them than the charter of salvation. Beloved brethren, friends of the Bible and of the Lord Jesus, this is the instrument which God himself has provided with which to subdue the earth to himself and triumph over sin and hell. Nothing can stand before a weapon whose edge has been tempered in heaven. It is our part to use this great weapon of our sacred warfare, this sword of the Spirit of God, which we know to be through him mighty to pull down every stronghold of iniquity, to use it as men who combat, not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers. Yes, as men who fight the good fight of faith, under the eye and guidance of him who has long ago openly triumphed over our stoutest enemies and led captivity captive. And why should doubts arise in our minds, or our faith or courage for a moment fail us? What hasn't the past witnessed? What victories of grace and redeeming love has it not received? Let history repeat itself. Time would utterly fail us to speak of the triumphs of this blessed volume in great antiquity. Its triumphs while it was itself incomplete, the triumphs of all, even its smallest parts, each adding trophy upon trophy as proof of its own title, to be added to the portions that had come from the skies before it. How great was its career throughout all the East, the great Shemite age, the early manhood of the world. Then, in the mighty transition age of the Greeks, Egypt, and Asia, surrendering civilization to Europe, Shem transferring the golden scepter to Japhet, the light of the world only chasing away the night before the advancing radiance of the light from above. Then came the mighty Caesars, victorious over all besides, and they and Rome itself subdued by three centuries of meek endurance and uncomplaining martyrdom, sat down also at the feet of Jesus. Its next trophies came from fierce barbarians, subdued by empires and by armies rather than by single men invading millions, the shadow of whose banners obscured the Roman world as they descended like successive floods, overwhelming every seat of civilization. Savages who without the Bible had sealed the doom of man, greater perhaps than all past, its achievements during the long night of the Middle Ages, that time and times and the dividing of times, when all open sacrifice of praise seemed lost, and the weeping and bleeding church sat desolate in the great moral wilderness, listening in silence to the only voice that dared speak truth or utter comfort. Here is that voice, meek but unbeaten, as in those centuries of despair. Here are those witnesses ready to speak and die and live again, as when the gloomiest sackcloth covered them. But God heard their testimony, when man was deaf to their pleas, and God restored again, as from the dead, his persecuted and corrupted church. The Reformation was in the strictest sense accomplished by the Bible, and its great fruits were the restoration of the Bible with its knowledge, liberty, and righteousness to man. Similar were the fruits of what men strangely call the Great Rebellion of England, but which was in fact a rebellion to God and against iniquity, which has until now exerted so great an influence over all the interests of the human race. And in the midst and by the means, and through the agents and influences of which, the Bible had its golden age in England. And last of all, amongst ourselves, amid all the blessings we enjoy and all the efforts we are making, what Christian does not admit that all, all are the fruits of the blessed word of God? And that word believed, obeyed, received into our hearts, and held forth in our lives. And all these great successes which the past records, all these victories which our eyes behold, are proofs to us, as from God himself, of what we might still achieve by the same living word. Let us not fear, let us not faint. Give us but the word of God and scope, 
to spread and teach it. All else is nothing. Let darkness revisit the earth. Let error, ignorance, and superstition return. Let the defeated enemies of truth and light come back and rule. Set up your tyrants in the state, your bigots over the church. Establish falsehood by the law, corrupt the ministers of truth, and burn once more its martyrs at the stake. Do this and more. Twice already, since Jesus bled, has it been done throughout the earth. Yes, done for long and bloody ages. And yet again, we expect such things will be, for so God said it would be. What then? Give us just the Bible, and we will purge your priesthood, dethrone your tyrants, defeat your bigots, put shame on error, and make again the martyr's blood the church's seed. Give us the Bible, the Bible without note or comment, the Bible as God gave it, and we will, with this alone, by God's indwelling grace, defy death and hell, and for the third time, conquer the world for Christ. In this sermon and speech he was giving, he makes it very clear that the Word of God is the most important thing you can give young people. So often, and and I I see this where I am overseas. I see I've seen this my entire life. Uh, we we always uh, there are not always we there will be people who will appeal to these other outside sources. Yes, we want to give them the Bible, but also but all, but all, but also they need these other things, and we don't want to over inundate them in Christianity, or we they need to be exposed to the world and all this stuff. And I just think that. Breckenridge makes a great point that if you're not building them on the Word of God, you're just not building them on anything else that matters. Everything else has a worldview and a sen- and an idea attached to it, and it's not that you can't expose or show them other things or read other books to them, but why wouldn't you start with the one book that comes to us from God, the most important book, the book that will build the firm foundation so they can understand those other things and whether or not it's about putting the Bible back in the public school or whether I think what, whether it's just raising your own children or helping to raise the new Christians and the church around you, whatever you are, I think all of us can apply this idea of putting that word of God first and foremost in all things because look at Breckenridge's life. He was a sinner living that party lifestyle, and when he became a Christian and made that word of God centered to him, you can just see how much his life changed. And because his life changed... His daughter and his grandson, B.B. Warfield, were able to live different lifestyles that were just completely raised in the Word of God and were able to make an impact that far outlived his own legacy because the Word of God became so central to him. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Revived Thoughts. Today's sermon was narrated by Nathaniel Owen. Big thanks to Nathaniel for recording this. And if you want to record an episode of Revived Thoughts, write into us, revivedthoughts at gmail.com. We can get you set up. At the top of this episode, we reminded you that we have a Patreon. If you listen to this episode and you go, I would like to know some more things about church history, you've got to hop on over to that Patreon feed and join us and listen to part one of the Taiping Rebellion episode and learn the insane, wild, interesting, fascinating twist and turn story. Uh, Lots of people said they liked the London Fire episode that we put out about a year ago. I love that episode, but I gotta say, I do think the Taiping Rebellion story is easily up there in the same category of just twist, turn, and what in the world is going to happen next kind of stuff. So we hope you will listen to it and join us on Patreon for it. This is Troy and Joel, and this is Revive Thoughts. Thoughts.